If you thought summer would be a slow time for AWS, you were proven wrong over the last month. There are a ton of announcements and updates to get to, so let's dive in. For Pluralsight, I'm David Tucker, and this is the August 2021 episode of Cloud Tracker for Amazon Web Services. Let's dive right into our featured announcements for this month. First, we have not one, but two announcements for serverless developers looking to implement continuous delivery for their cloud-based solutions. AWS has announced that the pipelines feature of the CDK is now generally available, and also that the pipelines feature for the serverless application model, or SAM, is also in public preview. Now, with CDK pipelines, you get an opinionated CICD pipeline construct that uses AWS services. Now, one of the great features of this construct is that the generated pipeline is self-mutating, meaning that it adds new steps to the build process as needed based on your application. Now, with the pipelines feature of SAM, you get templates for popular CI/CD tools, including GitHub, GitLab, Jenkins, as well as the AWS services like CodeBuild with Code Pipeline. Now, while these solutions have different features, both of them have the same goal, to make it easier for you to create a CI/CD pipeline that follows best practices for your serverless applications. Check out the links in the episode notes for more information. Now, next, DNS plays a central role in the availability of our applications, and AWS has announced a new set of capabilities for Route 53 that monitor your application's ability to recover from failures. These capabilities were released in the last month as a new feature called the Route 53 Application Recovery Controller. This feature is designed to provide this monitoring across availability zones, regions, and get this, even your on-prem data centers. So how does it do this? Well, this controller consists of two key parts, a readiness check and routing control. The readiness check monitors your environment's configuration while the routing control deals with managing traffic heading to your application in the event of a failure. And it has additional capabilities beyond what you could do with just Route 53 health checks. I have included a link to a complete overview of this new feature for Route 53 in the episode notes. Now, next, the Amplify team has added several capabilities to help developers create location-specific applications. This feature, named Amplify Geo, is currently available in a public preview. With this feature, developers can easily integrate the Amazon Location Service into their Amplify applications, as well as integrating maps that use MapLibre GL. Now, there are several use cases that can be solved with this feature, including integrating location search into your mobile application. You can test out the Amplify Geo JavaScript API for testing in your application, but remember, it's only in public preview. Check out the link in the episode notes for more information. Now, for our final featured announcement, we have some updates to the AWS global infrastructure. First, AWS Wavelink is adding zones in three US cities, Chicago, Houston, and Phoenix. Now, if you're new to Wavelink, this is the AWS service that provides mobile edge computing for 5G networks. Now, these new zones are all on Verizon's US network. But next, AWS is adding a local zone to Denver with a connection to the US West 2 region as its parent region. This is the seventh US-based local zone, and there are nine more that have been announced for the future. Now, next, we have our platform updates for AWS, and we have a lot to get to. First, it's clear that the future in AWS is multi-account, and AWS is investing time to make services play a bit nicer with this reality. Now, this month, they added the ability to leverage CloudWatch alarms across accounts. With this functionality, you can now have cross-account visibility for alarms, dashboards, and metrics. Check out the link in the episode notes for the documentation on how to get this up and running in your AWS organization. Next, AWS's Elastic Kubernetes Service, or EKS, now supports the Multis Container Networking Interface plugin. Now, the biggest gain from this is the ability to support multiple networking interfaces for your pods running on EKS. This gives you the ability to address a few additional use cases that previously weren't possible with EKS. In addition, it gives you the ability to implement additional security by having traffic isolation, which may be required for some specific compliance requirements. Now, check out the launch blog post from AWS for more information 
on how to enable multi-homed pods using Multis in your EKS environment. Next, the CloudFormation team has been busy. We have not one, not two, but three announcements for CloudFormation that we're combining here into a single update. First, CloudFormation now supports 79 new resource types. Now, this covers types from a large number of services that includes DynamoDB, KMS, SAS, Route 53, and many others. Check out the link in the episode notes for a full list. But next, CloudFormation now lets you import a CloudFormation stack into a stack set. This makes it even easier to work with stack sets without having to redo all of your infrastructure as code. And finally, AWS has increased the number of stacks that can be created in an account from 200 to 2,000. This means you have pretty much no reasons left to not embrace infrastructure as code within your AWS environment. Next, AWS has continued to add new capabilities to AWS Copilot, which is a CLI tool that makes it easy to launch containers in either ECS or App Runner. Now, over the last month, they have added in support for custom domain names when you're leveraging App Runner, as well as support for launching multiple environments within the same VPC. All of this is present in the new release, which is version 1.9. Check out the announcement post for more details. Next, for your machine learning workflows using SageMaker pipelines, you can now execute Lambda functions within the pipeline. Now, according to the announcement, there is a 10 minute limit on execution, which is a little bit less than the normal Lambda execution limit. But other than that, you can leverage Lambda for data prep, analysis, or whatever else you can think of. You can even import existing Lambda functions into the workflow. Now, next, with the addition of Sao Paulo and Paris, AWS Control Tower is now supported in 15 different regions. However, many organizations don't wanna to pay to spin up infrastructure in all of those regions. In addition, some organizations don't even want the ability to deploy in certain geographies due to some complex compliance requirements. So with this in mind, AWS has enabled the ability to perform region deselection with Control Tower. With this feature, you can leverage the multi-cloud goodness of Control Tower while making sure you will only be paying for the regions that you're actually going to use. Now, next, if you're leveraging GraphQL with AppSync, you now have an additional option for authorization, and that is to leverage a custom Lambda function. With this capability, you can now add in a completely custom approach to authorization and specify where this should be leveraged within your GraphQL API. Now, with this addition, you now have five different authorization approaches that you can leverage with AppSync. And this one adds the most flexibility if your use case doesn't fit with the other four. Now next, you can now select which instances to terminate in your EC2 auto scaling groups on scale-in. Now this is accomplished using a Lambda function, which will select the instances when you have a scale-in event. Now this feature isn't yet available in the AWS console. So if you wanna work with it, you'll need to leverage either the CLI or the SDK. Check out the link in the episode notes for information on getting started. Now, next, if you're interested in creating graph-based predictions using machine learning, you'll be excited to know that Amazon Neptune ML is now generally available. With this capability for AWS's graph-based database, you can leverage the open source deep graph library to select and train your graph neural network. AWS has provided multiple resources to help you get started, including a CloudFormation stack that has tutorials integrated with it. Check out the link in the episode notes for more information. Now, if you're looking to use IoT devices to monitor equipment data at the edge, you'll be glad to know that AWS IoT SiteWise Edge is now generally available. Check out the link for more details. Now, for our final platform updates, we have two updates for the healthcare sector. First, Amazon Health Lake is now generally available which gives you the ability to analyze healthcare data at a petabyte scale. And also, AWS Glue Data Brew is now HIPAA eligible. Check out the notes for more information on both of these announcements. For this month's learning resource, I have a video course that provides essential information for every AWS developer. Now this course, DevOps on AWS Getting Started, will walk you through the built-in services in AWS for DevOps. And this includes code deploy, AWS's managed deployment service, 
code build, AWS's managed build service, and AWS code pipeline, which is AWS's managed continuous delivery pipeline service. So with this course, you will get both a thorough understanding of each service and its capabilities alongside real world demos. You'll be able to go out and actually leverage these services for your own projects once you complete this course. Thank you for joining us for this month's Cloud Tracker for AWS. You can find links to everything I've discussed in the episode notes. I'll see you next month to discuss what's new in the cloud here on Cloud Tracker.